Mm. Rome could not defeat Persia. And that is why Augustus wanted to seal his relationship with Persia uh, and placate them by giving these diplomatic presents um, to Phratis IV. And one of the diplomatic presents was this so-called prostitute who was the daughter of Cleopatra. Right. So in this in this bloodline, then, so to speak, we have the mer- uh, the merger of of uh, the Romans, the Egyptians, and the Persians. Then, right? Yes. Now, this rather makes Jesus a rather important prince because of, essentially he is a prince of the three bloodlines of the three great empires. He was a prince of Rome. He was a prince of Egypt, and he was a prince of Persia. So, if he could find a throne to sit on. He could have been the king of the whole world, mm. the whole of the known world. So, yes, what I'm saying is he was um, an incredibly important person in that era, and he could have unified the entire known world. So, of course, he would have had a following who were trying to do just that. Right. Uh, just like any promoters of any prince, you know, if, if they can actually put their prince on a throne they become very important people as well. Yeah, yeah. So he would have had many backers, many rich and influential backers, who were trying to put him on the throne of not only Rome, but Persia as well. And this is what I think, this is where we come on to this new book that I've just written, right. not, um, not out yet. Um, it should be out at the end of April. And it seems likely that the whole of the New Testament story is a story about a revolution, a battle against the Romans, because Jesus didn't want just the throne of Judea, because we know he became king of of Judea, Uh, and that's quite implicit in the New Testament text, that he became king. That's why they called him the king of the Jews, because Mm -hmm. he was. Um, There's there's a good quote here from um, Robert Graves, who's one of our... um, eminent historians, or was, uh, of the 20th century. And he says, There need be no doubt that Jesus was anointed and crowned King of Israel, but the Gospel editors have done their best to conceal this for political reasons, Mm -hmm. while referring to him as Christ and the Chosen One. Mm. Um, Christ, of course, is, is not a religious title. It means King. Right. So does Messiah. The, the two titles, uh, you know, we, we sort of view these titles as being somehow mystical or spiritual or something special. They're not. They just mean king, both they're, of them. They're political terms almost. They're political terms. It just means king, the innocent yeah. one. So when we say Jesus Christ, what we're actually saying is King Jesus. Right. That was his title. That was his name. Of course. So he was a king of Judea. He was anointed as king of Judea, and he was anointed by Mary Magdalene. Mm. And this is why she was so important. And remember, we've just discussed before, Mary Magdalene was the richest woman in Judea. Mm. <laughs> and and also, in my research, she was also Jesus' sister as well. well. Okay, well, that's interesting, because, uh, I mean, what we're, you know, potentially could lead into here, then, is, is the, the idea of also of the bloodline, I guess, of Jesus Christ. I mean, this becomes important a little bit, I guess, today. Many people are, are looking into this and time, trying to figure out if there are descendants, so to speak, of this bloodline till uh, still to, to this day. Is this something that you touch upon or, at all? I do, but there's not enough information that i found so far to actually trace that bloodline. Right. However, I believe, yes, there was a continuance of that bloodline. It's quite clear that they had children. Um, uh, one of them is mentioned in, in the Book of Acts. Uh, where Saul, that Saul Josephus, actually blinds him. He's called Elias, El- Elimus, um, Ben Jesus, mm-hmm. Elimus, the son of Jesus. And uh, it's quite clear that, that that was one of the sons of, of Jesus. And there were several others as well. Sarah was one of the daughters. Um, their subsequent fate is unknown because there was a pogrom against all of the family of Jesus after this uh, revolution failed. Mm -hmm. So some of them may well have been wiped out. But, I mean, this was a large expanded family. I mean, Jesus had four brothers for a start. I mean, uh, I don't know why the Christian church doesn't like to promote the fact that he had brothers and sisters. Um, 
Well, he, he was the son of God, that's why, you know, it can only be one, right? But this is a huge cover-up, isn't it? I mean, sure. It's one of the, uh, Christianity is all about the family, and the only family they won't tell us about is the family of Jesus. Right, right. So, you know, we all go through Christian education, um, and one of the most important things must be the names of Jesus' blood brothers. Hmm. So what were his brothers' names? Do you know them? No, no idea. Well, I guess I, could, I guess we could. Uh, I mean, I've heard uh, about uh, John, of course, and and Mark possibly being one of them. I don't know. No, no. no. It was okay. James, Jude, Joseph, and Simon. Okay. Mm. So his his primary brother was James, who who led the church, um, supposedly after Jesus had died, but that's not quite true. Okay. Um, so these were his brothers. They're, they're named quite clearly in the New Testament. Everybody knows who they are. In, in terms of theologians and people who study, but in terms of the laity who follow Christianity, they don't even know the names of the brothers of of, of, of Jesus. Right. Why are they denied this information? Well, they're denied this information because of the cover-up. Because if you look, if you suddenly realize that he had brothers, if you suddenly realize that his brothers were called James, Jude, Joseph, and Simon, you suddenly begin to realize that half of his disciples were actually his brothers. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it, it no longer becomes such a special story as they've been trying to tell us. Suddenly this becomes a clan story. This is a story about a family. Right, exactly. His main supporters were his brothers and sisters, because Mary, was his, Mary and Martha were both of his sisters. Mm -hmm. So the very people who anointed him as king of Israel at the house in Bethany were his two sisters. <laughs> um, it also becomes obvious that the, the lady he married was also his sister. Mm. Now, that might sound a bit odd. Uh, you know, they'll be crying blasphemy from the, the tops of the steeples. Of course, of course. However, that was the custom. If yeah. you were in Egypt in this era, in fact, the whole of Egyptian history. <laughs> yeah. It, it was the duty of the royal family to marry a close family member. And yeah. It was normally a daughter or a sister. Uh, all of the Ptolemies, the Greek Ptolemy uh, pharaohs of Egypt, they all married uh, daughters and sisters. Queen Cleopatra herself married two of her brothers, mm -hmm. although I think she had no, she had no issue from them. But nevertheless, she married two of her brothers. Mm. It was a normal. In fact, it was a duty. It wasn't a normal event. It was a duty to maintain the bloodline. Right. And so if Jesus was of the Egyptian royal line, which is pretty obvious because the New Testament and Josephus both call him the Egyptian false prophet, hmm. so it's quite obvious that he was of the Egyptian royal line, then he would have married his sister. That was the tradition. And so Mary Magdalene was his wife and his sister. And, and even within... Um, Judea, you know, King Agrippa, who was the, the king, first century king of, of Judea, mm -hmm. he married his sister as well, Berenice. Mm -hmm. There we go. It, it was part of the normal custom. Right. So, you know, the, this is the true history of the New Testament that they don't want to, you to know about because it conflicts so greatly with what they're trying to teach us. So, if we take in this to account and, and, and think about it, this becomes a an agenda of one family. This is a dynasty that is um, that the, the, they're they're striving for the control of the earth. But what happened? I mean, they they did well, not succeed. They, they were a royal family without a throne to sit upon. Yeah. So they were exiled to this uh, city state, which I now say is Palmyra, which is a a marvelous city on the borders of Syria and Persia. Okay. And suddenly. Uh, Palm Palmyra was a village. It's an oasis in the middle of nowhere. It's in a desert between the Euphrates and Syria. Mm -hmm. It is utterly barren except for this one little tiny oasis, which was used obviously as a caravan stop between Syria and, and Persia. And suddenly, in the first century, this little village on this oasis became a vast Roman city. Mm. Why? How? Where did the money come from? Well, it seems quite obvious to me that the money came from Queen Thea Musa Aurania, who was the Queen of Persia, who was booted out of Persia in 
AD 4. Mm. And incidentally, she was kicked out of Persia because she married her brother. No, correction, she married her son. There we go. Again, mm. the Egyptian tradition. Mm. And, and Josephus makes it quite clear that this was not a Persian tradition at all. So this was, again, the Egyptian tradition. She married her son, and they kicked her out of Persia. Hmm. And suddenly, this oasis village in the middle of nowhere suddenly sprouts into an enormous great Roman city. And that was on the back of the royalty who fled to that city when they were kicked out of, of uh, Persia. Hmm. Anyway, in my first book, I, I, I wrote that they probably were evicted from, from Persia and were relatively poor, etc. Mm -hmm. But it's quite apparent, actually, from my later um, research that when they went out of Persia, they must have taken with them half of the uh, Persian treasury as well. Really? Huh. So they were not short of a few shekels, that's for sure. <laughs> and it was this treasury, this enormous great wealth of Persia, that paid for this enormous great city in the middle of nowhere. The city of the desert, Palmyra, and and uh, so they were trying to set this up as the, as the as the world headquarters, so to speak. Yes, this um, was going to be the new world headquarters, and right. from here you needed to launch a a bid. Firstly, for the throne of Judea, which they succeeded with, although not entirely succeeded, because obviously a lot of Judeans didn't go along with it. Mm. But the next. Um, target was the throne of Rome. So what Jesus was looking for was to become the next emperor. Mm. And that was what the Jewish revolt was all about. He was trying to start a revolution that started in Judea, but would roll along the entire Roman Empire so that he would end up as emperor of Rome. Right. Now, all of this, we have to restage this a little bit later, because Obviously, the biblical text seemed to say that Jesus was crucified in AD 33. Well, it doesn't, actually. There is nothing within the New Testament that actually gives you a... a, a well, I suppose, yes, um, the presence of uh, Pontius Pilate gives you some clue, but that is... Um, there are alternative sections in the New Testament which give you an alternate... The, uh, date for the crucifixion. Okay. You read the equivalent components within Joseph's story. Every single item in the New Testament, in the real historical story from Josephus and from the uh, Roman historians, each event takes place in the AD 60s, not the AD 30s. Mm -hmm. So, so this story that we have in the New Testament is completely at odds with the historical references that it's trying to actually point toward, hmm. um, except for the, the presence of Pontius Pilate. He's about the only exception. So this entire story actually happened in the AD 60s. Okay. This is when Jesus became High Priest of Jerusalem, and, and, and he did. It's in the historical record. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus of Gamala became High Priest in AD 63. So all of these events happened in the AD 60s during the run-up to the Jewish Civil War. And it was to be this Jewish Civil War that was going to roll across uh, the whole of Rome and, and place Jesus uh, upon the throne of Rome. Right. And the reason for this was because the throne of Rome was empty. Nero had just died. So this was... Being this was a perfect opportunity, so to speak, too. perfect to opportunity. That there was unrest in Rome. The, the three emperors came and went within the space of one year. Mm -hmm. The throne was, was, was vacant. It was open to whoever could claim it. And, and the primary... Um, uh, the, the primary oracle that was circulating the Roman Empire at the, at the time was the star prophecy. Mm -hmm. And the star prophecy said that a star from the east would become the ruler of the world. Mm. And of course, the star from the east was Jesus himself. This is why we have the story of the star over the nativity scene. Right. When Jesus was born.